Good morning. Thank you for joining us for morning prayer on Sunday, October 17th, here at St. Paul's. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. A reading from Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness and because of this he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And he does not presume to take this honor but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears, to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples, but over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night, you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel of Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. When the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve. And to give His life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. I have a very dear friend who has a couple of kids. They're both growing up now. They're both in their early 20s. And when our kids were growing up together, he he was always about creating teachable moments with his kids. So, for instance, one time we're riding bikes near the beach and one of the boys rode his bike in the sand and it made the chain come off the bike and he stopped and explained the inner workings of a bicycle, inner and outer workings of, workings of a bicycle and fundamental rules of physics that would make it so a chain came off a bike. When in reality, we were all burning up and just ready to get the lunch. And it just would have been great, just would have been great to put the chain back on the bike and, and go on again. <laughs> and this is always true. And it's something that 
like a lot of things that are true about people that we love, you know, it's one of those minor irritants that uh, is oftentimes uh, a real uh, point of affection for this person in my life. Granted, I do learn a lot from his wisdom, <laughs> freely offered and not always wanted, but I do learn a lot. It's a relationship that uh, has made my life better uh, but made me sometimes impatient. <laughs> we all get teachable moments, and I think a prayer that we all ought to have as we get older is that those teachable moments never end. I know I turned 55 here in the last couple of weeks, and one of the things that I pray for is that I never stop learning and that I never stop growing up and evolving in my views of the world and especially in my views of God and of Jesus and how I choose to live Jesus and I'm blessed to live, uh, live my Christianity and to live like Jesus during my lifetime. So many of you in this church that I have come to know and love over these last two years do exactly that. You're constantly learning and constantly evolving. Over the last few weeks in the Gospel of Mark, we've been witnessing the evolution of the disciples' understanding of what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, to be the Messiah. They, they had an idea of exclusivity a few weeks ago when a person was healing using Jesus' name but was not a part of them, and Jesus said, no, go on, let him." They had a view of uh, Jesus being this very important person who maybe did not have time for certain people. Yet Jesus has always cleared the way for everyone when he could. I think they also had a view of being, him being uh, human when they have seen him in several occasions uh, steal off to take a nap or to say, you know, that's enough for today. And today, that evolution continues. James and John, the son of Zebedee, have obviously been having an argument, and this is an argument that the disciples have had in previous readings that we've had over who is the greatest. And now, uh, instead of these two saying, well, you know, uh, one of us is the greatest, they're brothers, so they come to Jesus and they say, well, you know what? Uh, will you do what we ask of you? Kind of a trick question. And Jesus says, well, yeah, of course. And I say, I'll tell you what. Well, put one of us at your left hand and one of us at your right hand. And so James and John have now won the argument by sharing power for themselves. And they've won the argument with the other 10 disciples. And indeed, the other 10 disciples are angry with them because they've gone to Jesus and it seemingly tricked him into this. So their, their understanding of what it means to be the Christ is still uh, in need of a teachable moment. And, and in fact, will undergo many teachable moments from here on out in the gospel. And yet again, Jesus has to issue a not so subtle but loving correction to them. He talks about how uh, the leaders over the Gentiles, meaning the Romans, how they lord power over them and are tyrants is the word that he uses. And unfortunately, I believe that's the kind of power that they have in mind, that Jesus will be in charge and that they will be the shared number two in Jesus' cabinet or council or whatever. One will sit at the right hand, and one will sit at the left. And so Jesus has to correct this by reminding them of a few things. Jesus has to uh, strip from them their notions of how uh, life with him is somehow connected to competitiveness, is somehow connected to uh, coming out on top. We see this over and over and over and over again with the disciples. I don't ever think they quite get it fully until 
They see Jesus die on the cross and they see Jesus come back again from the dead. See, we have a lot of notions of competitiveness that are really built into us as human beings and especially enculturated into us as Americans, especially. I love to play sports. I'm a tennis player. I'm an okay club player. I play fairly often. I love to win. I especially love to win against someone who's half my age. Occasionally, I will play young men who will call me sir when we play. (laughs) I love to beat those guys. And I'm sure a lot of you do competitive things too. We have a couple of sports coaches in our midst. We have uh, a fairly well-recognized, well-decorated high school referee in our midst. We have a lot of high school athletes in our midst. And all that's great. Competitiveness is a wonderful thing. But of course, it's only wonderful, I believe, when we can leave that behind us on the court or the playing field. And when we get older, that competitiveness continues, of course, because uh, we live in a capitalistic economy that is really all about free and uh, sort of unfettered competition between people. If your business makes a lot of money, uh, the way it goes in a capitalist economy is that it's making a lot of money because others did not. There's a finite amount of money, the thinking goes, so we have to scramble and compete for our piece of that. And of course, the same goes true with political leaders today. There's a finite number of voters that they compete for. And so we are surrounded with competitiveness. It's around us 24-7. It's inescapable. Yet Jesus is not about competitiveness. He's not about coming out on top. He's not even really about success. Because his correction in this teachable moment contradicts the notion of competitiveness. He says, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to be master, you have to be servant to all. Would that we, like the disciples, could get this once and for all. And then could recognize that while uh, we may have to live in this competitive world, and and deal with competitiveness from other people and participate in competitive activities, it's not what God ultimately created us for, is it? In fact, I would dare say that the fact that we live in such a competitive world, a dog-eat-dog world, a a world in which uh, we could easily say that, as, as the saying goes, nature is red, in tooth and claw, it's a sign of the world's brokenness, perhaps. That we live in a state where uh, we believe that there's not quite enough for everyone. One of the realities of that, though, is that there is actually plenty for everyone. In a book I just read called Abundance, the writers talk about how Uh, There is enough food to feed everyone. There's enough water for everyone to have plenty to drink and to bathe in. There's even enough money to go around. The problem is distribution. We don't have the means. We don't have uh, the the will as people uh, to distribute that stuff of the world. And so we live in a competitive climate where places like the United States have more than we need. and In fact, most of us hoard resources and other places have none. And if ever there was evidence that the world was a broken place, it would be that, I believe. 
And so Jesus issues us this corrective. See, to follow me, you have to step outside of that competitiveness. To follow me means to leave that behind, to repent of that, and to do something else with your life other than stay in competition with one another, and especially in competition with those uh, whom you need to serve. Let's look for some places in our lives where we can uh, own our competitiveness and suspend that competitiveness for the sake of someone else. Think about in your place of work. Maybe there's someone who's struggling who works with you or, or is a direct report to you. Maybe uh, part of what you can do is to go and, and to lend your help to them. To help them to come along in their work. Maybe here within church, there's an opportunity for you uh, to mentor somebody else. To take your precious time and to spend it on another person here within this church. Maybe within one of your primary relationships, there's a tension that you notice that is competitiveness. And own that. And ask God to heal that. And then pursue that healing by seeking out ways that you can serve that person. These teachable moments surround us. And at the heart of them as we follow Christ is Jesus beckoning us to follow Him in His way. Not by lording over other people, but by serving all. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us from wherever we are, we are bold to sing.
prayers of the people. O God, creator, redeemer, spirit, the one who knows and loves us best, we thank you for the great gift of your presence among us. Hold us close when we struggle with the noise of life. Call us to a quiet place so that we can hear your voice and come to understand your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep your church rooted in your word and grounded in your love. Guide our leaders as they walk beside us, supporting us in our journey of faith. We pray for Robert, our bishop. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give those an authority and imagination and determination for peace between peoples, of plenty for all, of justice for everyone, even those who are forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In places where famine and weather disasters have destroyed lives and drained people of hope, we pray for those who suffer loss, as well as those who seek to relieve their distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for healing for those close to us whom we now name, Pat Allen, Louisa Anthony, Mary Bowden, Harriet Bowens, Silva Britt, Judy Coombs, Ida Demons, Ivory Duhart, Kimberly English, Vanita Ford, Charles Fowler, Kayla Hall, Cleopatra Johnson, Leighton Johnson, Barbara Manson, Carl Manson, Jervis Manson, Francis B. Martin, Clarence Mitchell, Christy Moffitt, Arletta Morant, Vincent Murray, Dorothy Ratliff, Mildred Singleton, Bonnie Smith, Edna Stevens, Emory Stevens, James Ward, Jerry Ward, Mary Ware, Anne Washington, Charlie Winston, and Jackie Ford Wright. Assure them of your goodness that never ends, your grace that surrounds them on every side. We pray also for those who are voiceless, who have never known you, who are imprisoned by fear, that we witness to them your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are born today as well as those who are being welcomed home to your eternal kingdom. We pray for the deceased. May your will for each of those you love be fulfilled here on earth and in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, dear siblings in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. I'm Tim Black. I'm the interim rector here at St. Paul's. For a few more weeks, on November 7th, we will be welcoming Mother Pauline Samuel, uh, the new rector of St. Paul's. We're so excited. 
Um, and if you're visiting with us today online, please let us know who you are by emailing us at welcome at stpaulsatl.org right here. So we can invite you back. St. Paul's is already on its way into the next chapter of life together here. We would love for you to be a part of that. We are having noonday and evening prayer during the week and Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, please get, on our, get in on our email list and then you can get more information about those and other activities. And also, uh, please keep in mind that this is pledge season here at St. Paul's. And if you have never pledged before, please consider doing so. One of the things that's interesting about St. Paul's is there's uh, a lot of people who pledge here. Y'all are well above the national average, but there's also a lot of people who donate uh, quite generously, who give quite generously, but do not pledge. Pledging enables us to plan for the mission and ministry of this church and to be proactive and to have our budget be a reflection of our values. And the more we can plan for that, the more that can be possible. So please consider making a pledge. Even if it's a small pledge, just a fraction of what you're going to ultimately give, any amount that you can pledge will be helpful for us in planning our life together as Christ followers. In the coming weeks, we will be moving from having a separate pre-recorded service to an in-person service to having one streaming service. Um, next week, we will be having a pre-recorded service at 10 o'clock that will be featuring uh, the youth of St. Paul's um, in our uh, monthly youth service. We're moving from the fifth week to the fourth week. And at 11.15, we'll be live streaming the in-person service as well. Then on October 31st, which happens to be my last Sunday with you, uh, we're going to live stream one service at 10 a.m. So we will all be worshiping together, finally, online and in person, all together at the same time. So thanks be to God for all the hard work that folks have done around here to get a streaming system in place, and we look forward uh, to adding that to the many ministries that we have here at St. Paul's. Now I'd like to turn things over to the vestry for announcements. Good morning, St. Paul's. My name is Michael Blakely, and I'm your senior board. I'd like to thank you for worshiping with us this Sunday morning. Again, if this is your first time worshiping with us, welcome home. We'd like to consider you one of ours now. On the cup announcements, uh, the gift bag giveaway that we do for the students of F.L. Stanton and Peyton Forest Elementary Schools. Uh, please, uh, they're getting an early start on that, so please take a look at your bulletin and see how you can help out in this effort. Also, the Fruit and Fresh Market will start on Thursday, October 21st, and go for four consecutive weeks. And finally, the good news on the air conditioning, we're just about completed that, that um, process. And the only thing left uh, with a few electrical problems uh, will be the uh, cage. We'll put a cage around it to protect the units and the copper wire. I'd like to say thank you again for worshiping with us and have a blessed day. Thank you. To whom much is given, much will be required. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Hi, St. Paul's. I'm a member of St. Paul's EYC. This verse from Luke has been shared with me many times throughout my life. I've heard it at home, during church service, and through Sunday school stewardship lessons. It reminds me that we are all blessed with unique gifts that can be used to serve others. My peers and I give our time, talents, and treasure in multiple ways. Examples of us actively participating in stewardship at St. Paul's are evident. Our talent has been visible through the children's choir, playing instruments, and even virtually when we've shared artwork during online services. We give our time by serving on the altar, participating in outreach activities through EYC, like packaging items for homeless youth, and preparing gift bags at Christmas. After these activities, I always feel good and hope that I've made a positive difference in someone's life. We also participate in stewardship by sharing our treasures. We pledge to give offerings and use our funds to purchase items for those in need. Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. 
Our church members have been using their time, talents, and treasure to spread the love of God for 141 years. As a member of St. Paul's, I am proud to con continue that tradition through stewardship and encourage others to do the same. Stewardship gives us an opportunity to share our blessings by serving God, helping others, and making a significant impact in church and community. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice for the whole world. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.
Have a great week, everyone. Join us for worship next Sunday morning here online at 10 o'clock or at 11.15 in person here at St. Paul's Episcopal Church.